Are you going out of your mind trying to figure out the best tipping policy for your restaurant? Stick around. I got you. How you doing? Dave Allred, The Real Barman here from barpatrol.net and therealbarman.com. Today's topic is one of the hottest topics for bar and restaurant owners and managers, mainly because no matter what tipping policy you come up with, someone's always going to be unhappy. And unfortunately, this is not uncommon in our industry. Okay, nobody bitches or moans more than bar and restaurant in- industry employees, and I can say that because I'm one of them. All right, so I'm going to help you out with this today, but first, I just want to say, if you are a podcaster who likes to listen audibly, and yes, I'm fully aware that that's redundant, listen audibly, Karen, all right, but if you like to absorb your content while you multitask, you can check me out on the Real Barman Podcast, where we've placed all of my video content on there for you to listen to, so go check it out, and I'll be the little voice in your head while you, I don't know, clean the toilet. All right, with that said, let's jump into the fire. Today, I'm going to give you a little tip splitting slash tip pooling training. So grab a coffee. We'll spend some time together. I'll put on a little soft music. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. I like that. And then we'll talk about what you can do, what you can't do, as well as what your options are when it comes to tipping. All right, the main problem is that with this policy, it's not standardized in our industry. All right, the tipping policies are all over the place and everyone's doing something different. And like I said, there's hardly ever an instance in which everyone agrees it's fair. All right, with that said, I'm gonna put myself out there at the risk of great criticism and ridicule. And I'm gonna give you my system that I believe is the simplest and works the best. But that by no means makes it law. And I'll also go over all the other, other options as well. Okay, now these tipping policies vary so widely depending on your restaurant. Depends on how busy you are, how much staff you have, what state you live in. All right, so you need to adjust accordingly and do what's best for you and your restaurant. The other thing to consider is that if you're opening a restaurant from scratch, you can absolutely implement any policy you want because it's your restaurant and when you hire people, they have to adhere to your rules or you're not gonna hire them. But when you already have a policy in place, you're gonna have a lot more friction from your staff if you're making a big change. All right, so let's start with a tip credit. All right, perhaps you already know what this is or you already have it in place, but under federal law, some states allow restaurants to take what is called a tip credit against the minimum wage of their state. All right, let's look at an example. So the national minimum wage at the time of this video is $7.25 per hour. In most states it's more, but we're gonna use this as our example. In states that allow a tip credit, the federal government requires a wage of at least $2.13 per hour to be paid to employees who receive at least $30 per month in tips. If wages and tips do not equal the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour during, during any week, the employer is required to increase cash wages to compensate. All right, that means the employees must be making at least $5.12 per hour in this example. All right, you like that? That's called math. No calculator needed. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so, but you'll wanna make sure to check out your state and see if a tip credit's allowed, as it's gonna save you a lot on labor. And in fact, once we get into tip pooling, if you get multiple employees on that tip credit, it's gonna save you a ton on labor. You just have to make sure that they're exceeding that min wage. All right, now this may seem obvious, but only employees that make tips can participate on the tip credit. All right, I just gotta make sure we're not leaving anyone behind. Okay, now let's talk about splitting tips using a tip-out structure. This tip-out method is the most traditional method that bars and restaurants have used over the years and the one that I'm most comfortable with. But of course, I'm a bit biased because I used to be a bartender. All right, so in the traditional tip-out structures, servers and bartenders bring in the tips, then they tip out the other job positions that have helped them out during the day or night. Okay, so the hierarchy looks like this. At the top of the heap, we have the bartenders. All right, this is the most coveted position in the hospitality industry. Okay, and then right below them, we have the servers. Now, I'm not saying that the bartenders are better people because they're above them. I'm just saying, if you were to ask people whether they like to bartend or serve, 19 or 20 are gonna say bartend. So it is the most coveted position. They usually make more money. Now, I do know servers and cocktail servers who can make more money than bartenders, but in general, this is how it works. Now, the bartenders and servers, they bring in all the money. Okay, and I know that there's other positions on the floor that are all working together to make money, but the bartenders and servers are the only ones that actually ring in sales. So they're the ones that bring in the tips and then those have to filter down to the other positions. We put the money down through the filter and the other positions are positions like bussers, bar backs, hosts and hostesses, and food runners. Okay, so all that money is gonna filter down to them. Uh, 
Most places do not tip hosts and hostesses, but some do, so I'm gonna include, include them anyway. Okay, so let's remove the money and let's start with how much the servers should tip out the bartenders in a, in a tip out structure. Okay, servers, in my opinion, should tip out about three to 5% of their bar sales. Okay, some places will have them tip out on their total sales, but I just don't think this is fair that the servers should tip out on food sales to their bartenders. Like if they're working a lunch shift and they have like $20 in bar sales and they have you know, 800 or $1,000 in food sales, why are they tipping the bartenders for food sales when the bartenders had nothing to do for that, uh, do with that? Okay, so three to 5% of the bar sales going to the servers. Let's, let's take a look at an example. Let's look at this three to 5% tip example, just to give you an idea of what that might look like. So let's say that a server has $500 in bar sales. All right, and let's say that the average drink costs $7, all right? They might order beers for $3, they might order a cocktail for $10. Let's say that the average drink is $7. That means that the bartender has to make 71.4285 drinks. Okay, I don't know how you make 0.4285 of a drink. Maybe it's weak, I don't know. Let's round that down to 71 drinks made. That's quite a bit of work. Okay, this is why they're getting tipped out. They're working hard for you. So that would come out to 15 to $25 that they would tip out the, the bartender, each server that has $500 in sales. All right, does that make sense? Now let's get rid of that. The servers should tip out their bussers around 10 to 15% of their total tips. Okay, so if they're making $100 in tips, they're gonna tip them out 10 to $15. Bartenders should tip out their bar backs 10 to 20% of total tips, and it goes up to 20%. I usually, in my experience, feel that bar backs are usually doing a little bit more work than the bussers. This is not always the case. So many different bars and restaurants are just so different all over the place. So for both of these, you could go anywhere from 10 to 20%. If they're doing a lot of work, you're gonna wanna tip them more. If they're just being kind of lazy or they just don't have as many job duties, you would tip less. So somewhere in the 10 to 20% range. Now, like we said, hosts and hostesses usually don't make money, but we are gonna talk about a tip pool in which you can include them. We'll talk about that in just a moment. If you have food runners specifically assigned to run food, some places do, some places don't. We're talking three to 4% of the food sales from the bartenders and the servers. Okay, these, these food runners can actually make quite a bit of money. I used to work at a claim jumper like 25, 30 years ago, got 30 years ago now. And our food runners would make like 200 bucks a night because there were so many servers and the plates were heavy and they were working their butts off. So uh, three to 4% to the food runners. Let's get rid of that. Let's talk about a mini tip pool. If you wanna include the food, runner, food runners and hosts in a mini tip pool, that means that the other positions are excluded from this. Okay, so this is a, just another option. You would do five to 10% on the total sales to the mini tip pool. Okay, does that make sense? Oh, this arrow is not supposed to be here. So don't ignore that arrow. Okay, that's all of my recommendations for tip percentages. Let's talk about managers really quick. All right, can owners and managers participate in a tip pool? Or what about the uh, kitchen staff in the back? Well, owners and managers can never participate in any tips whatsoever. It's illegal for them to take tips. So if your owner or manager is taking tips from you and you are a, an employee, you need to uh, say something and work that out. The kitchen staff cannot take it or the chef cannot take it if they are participating in the tip credit, but if they are not, then they can. And that's why this guy's like, woohoo, he's a baby. Okay, are you with me? Does that all make sense? I hope so. Okay, now let's talk about tip pooling. Tip pooling is defined as taking the collective amount of tips brought in by the servers and bartenders and splitting them evenly or semi-evenly by work group usually so that everyone involved gets compensated for their work with tips. Now you might be asking yourself, what are the advantages or disadvantages of putting a tip pooling policy into place? Let's take a look. So we're gonna start off with reasons for tip pooling. Okay, first off, distributing tips to more employees means that in states where it is allowed, owners can take advantage of the tip credit, which we spoke of earlier, which means you're saving a lot of money on labor. So this is a, an advantage for the owner, all right? not necessarily the staff. It forms a teamwork mentality and therefore services better. Now this aligns with what I've been fired up about lately, which is the GoTab uh, POS system, which is a free POS and QR ordering code. Uh, if you go watch some of my other videos on GoTab, 
you can see how we're doing this new restaurant model where everyone works as a team, they all split tips, and it's a lot easier to distribute them as well. So this is a good advantage. When everyone's receiving tips, everyone's happy, which results in less turnover. All right, so the teamwork mentality is a good reason for tip pooling. Now, the reasons to not do a tip pooling. Tip pooling can cause anger among the staff members used to, used to traditional tipping methods, which can also cause turnover. So if you're getting some old schoolers and they've been doing it one way and all of a sudden you bring this in, all right, they might leave your place. Stronger employees bringing in more tips but being paid less because of others' lack of production can cause for disgruntled employees. And this is a big one for me. I do agree with this. I don't think that strong employees should be punished when they're doing a great job and they have some slackers working around them and, and you're splitting tips. This can cause a lot of problems. Uh, the one way to solve this is make sure that your stronger employees get the best shifts and that makes them happy. And finally, putting in a new system like this can be a monstrous task for you with unpredictable results. All right, now remember, if you are in a state that allows the tip credit, you must make sure everyone is making over minimum wage by receiving enough tips from the tip pool. I can't stress this enough, this is a legality. In addition, federal law allows a, mand a mandatory tip pooling, but in some states it's prohibited, which overrides federal law. That's very confusing. So you need to make sure you're checking it out. So if you quote unquote encourage or require a tip pool, you need to make sure it's legal to do so in your state. Tip pooling in some states on is only allowed to be done voluntarily by the staff. All right, let's bring back our workers now. Okay, we're bringing out the bartenders and the servers and the bussers and the barbacks and the hosts and hostesses and the food runners and even the kitchen, okay, the chef right here. Now, what we're talking about here is doing a large tip pool for all of them. We talked about a mini tip pool earlier for the host and the food runner, but if you're gonna participate in all of it, this is everyone that's involved. And you have to remember that the bartenders and servers are the only ones bringing in money, and the more people you have involved in the tip pool, the less money everyone's gonna make. So if you bring in like the kitchen staff, that means less money for everyone. So you have to decide if the kitchen staff and the host and the hostesses are gonna be involved in this, or if they are, you might give them less percentage. It's totally up to you. Uh, there's a lot to consider here. So there's two questions you need to ask yourself. One, who's gonna be included in or excluded from the tip pool, like we just mentioned? And two, how will the tips be distributed among the different work, work groups? These are the most important questions. Also, don't forget that if you're going to impl implement a tip pool that you need to maintain precise records of the amount of tips reported and how much was tipped out to each person in case you get audited. Okay, so let's go back here. I'm gonna talk about a tip pooling distribution and there's no perfect way to do this. I'm gonna give you a ballpark estimate of what I would do to at least give you something to start with from the ground up, all right? So you're not starting in the dark. So let's say that during the shift, a total of $1,000 came in, okay? Bartenders, right around 35%. Servers at 24%. I know that seems like an odd number, but this is all gonna add up to 100%. The barbacks and uh, bussers splitting 12%, and then depending on who you're gonna tip out there at the bottom, they would all get 5%, or you can distribute that however you'd like. So there's like a ballpark, and you can move those uh, numbers around however you like. And then remember that the manager is responsible for collecting all the tips and distributing them either after the shift or the next day. So you can put them in little envelopes, and they can uh, come pick them up, which is a pain in the butt because they're coming in during a busy shift. And they're like, hey, can I get my tips? Uh, kind of frustrating <sighs> to deal with all the time. So that's kind of another disadvantage of doing the tip pool is dealing with all those little uh, envelopes. All right, moving on. Now let's quickly talk about the hourly tip breakdown. Now, most of you already know what an hourly tip breakdown is. It's basically how to disperse the tips within a work group when the workers within that work group work different time lengths. All right, so you have three bartenders, they all work behind the bar, they bring in tips. How do we tip out each bartender based on how many hours they work? It's very simple, but if you're a beginner, I wanna show you really quick, just because this is an all-inclusive training on the tip methods, so I don't wanna leave anything out. All right, so let's just go over a quick example so you can see how it works. In this example, let's say that we have three bartenders. And let's say that bartender A works eight hours, bartender B works six hours, and bartender C works four hours and during the shift they brought in $700 of tips total. Okay, now we need a formula. We need to figure out what the hourly is and how each bartender makes their income. So the formula first for the hourly is 
total tips divided by total hours. Okay, and then the income is going to be the hourly that we figure out multiplied by how many hours each bartender works. Okay, so first off the hourly. We had a total of 18 hours. We had eight hours, six hours, and four hours. That adds up to 18. The total tips were $700. So when we divide 700 by 18, we get an hourly of 38.9. That's the hourly. Now to figure out the income, bartender A worked eight hours. If you multiply it by the hourly of 38.9, that bartender made $311. Bartender B, six times 38.9 made 233, and bartender C working four hours made $156. Does that make sense? Okay, it's very simple math, but if you haven't done it before, you know, it might be confusing for you. So there's the formula. Okay, and then to finally to finish up, let's talk about the no tipping policy. What is the no tipping policy? Well, in 2015, Danny Meyer of the Union Square Hospitality Group and the author of Setting the Table, which is actually a very good book, but he decided to eliminate tipping in all of his restaurants. He believed it was a discriminatory practice and created inequality among the workers and that a no tipping policy was fair for everyone. Now, you're welcome to have whatever opinion you want about this, but I am in total disagreement with Mr. Meyer on this. I understand that some workers are at the bottom of the totem pole and get paid less, but I'm not sure why he thinks the restaurant industry is different than say a traditional corporation in which you have a hierarchy of power and salary. To me, this is like a secretary or assistant in the company suddenly demanding that he or she make the same salary as the CEO. All right, I know that might sound harsh to the bleeding hearts out there, but again, if you want a more coveted position that makes more money, I say you work your way up to busser at a bar back, server, bartender. Don't just expect that you're owed money because you want it to be fair. All right, when you think about it, the Danny Meyer system is more closely aligned to a philosophy similar to someone else you may have heard of. Yep, this guy, Karl Marx, the father of socialism. Equality for all, despite talent or hard work or whatever position you've earned. All right, now I'm not gonna turn this into a political debate. I'm not even that political at all. But one thing I strongly believe in is if you work and rise and earn a coveted position that you've been seeking out and you've worked hard for and you put your time in and you get that position, you shouldn't be penalized just so everyone else can share in what you earned and worked hard for. All right, and if you don't like that hosts don't make tips, then don't be a host or be a host and work up to becoming a server. Don't hang your head and moan like someone just took your crayons away. All right, now don't get me wrong. I am all about helping the underdog and people who need it, but I'm not about penalizing those who have earned their spot because they were resourceful enough, hardworking enough, and smart enough to find a way to get that, into that position. All right, that's just my two cents. Since you can believe whatever you want, that's why it's great to live here. All right, it's your right to voice your opinion and make those around you cranky because you won't think like they do. All right, well, to update you really quick on Danny on the Danny Meyer situation, back in 2020. Danny Meyer and others practicing the no tipping policy announced that they would be getting rid of it as it was too complicated to implement and it simply wasn't working. <laughs> yeah, do you think? Servers and bartenders weren't happy at all and they quit to go work somewhere else so they didn't have to share their hard earned position with the greenhorns who just got hired. All right, the no tipping policy caused the turnover rate to skyrocket and less talented people were being hired to provide service that wasn't very good service at all. So I don't recommend the no tipping policy whatsoever unless you want to ride on your hands or at the very least a very inexperienced and talented, talentless wait staff and a lot of bad uh, Yelp reviews as well. So that's my two cents on the tipping scene. I hope this helped you out some. I know this was a long training video, but this is a complicated concept depending on your restaurant dynamics and which state you live in. And because of that, unfortunately, I can't tell you what to do. You're gonna have to take the information I provided, sit down with your managers, maybe some of your staff members, in order to hopefully put in a tipping policy that will make everyone as happy as they can be. It's just not going to be perfect. Okay, with that said, I'm done here. I wanna thank you for hanging out. I really do appreciate you being here. I am gonna see you next time. I'm out. <laughs>